This is John Amis talking about music from London. In our program today, George Malcolm talks about Purcell's keyboard music and plays some of it on the harpsichord, and Lotta Lehmann will be heard reminiscing about Richard Strauss and singing and teaching. First in the program are a conductor's views on the art of rehearsing. Sir Adrian Bolt dips into his 40 years experience. He started in the theatre with Diaghilev, was principal conductor of the BBC for 20 years, and then conductor-in-chief for the London Philharmonic. Here is Sir Adrian Bolt. I often wonder what our audiences think about the matter of preparation for an orchestral concert. I dare say that it isn't generally realised that the average BBC symphony concert usually needs three rehearsals of three hours each, and may have as many as six. Planning a rehearsal is a personal thing, and with the greatest respect, I often feel that some of my most distinguished colleagues waste a tremendous amount of time and energy, their own energy as well as that of their chorus, orchestra and soloists, by starting at the beginning of the first rehearsal and insisting on a perfect performance of the first few bars before they proceed any further. There are some who will never allow the slightest blemish to pass without stopping the music, pointing out what was wrong, even if the error is obvious to everyone in the room, and starting again some little way back. We had a very eminent visitor at the BBC in pre-war days who never gave the orchestra a chance of playing the work straight through and getting a picture of it as a whole until the actual performance. One of the players told me that he didn't think they had ever been allowed to play more than ten bars at a stretch without being pulled up for something. Some conductors seem to be afraid that if they let a mistake pass without instantly stopping and commenting on it, the orchestra will think that they have scored off the conductor and will boast that they got away with something the old man didn't notice. This painstaking and meticulous method may perhaps be right and necessary with the more unsophisticated players of Southern Europe. It was the early method of Toscanini and of others of the greatest conductors of their time, but it is undeniable that it uses up an enormous amount of rehearsal time and is quite fatal for the quick rehearsing that so often is forced on us in this country by economic necessity. I personally would go far further and say that besides wasting time, it is, from the psychological standpoint, an absolutely wrong approach to Anglo-Saxon professionals. Our people like to be led, not driven. And if I may adopt a sporting analogy, I feel rather like the trainer of a team or a crew and want to begin gently and easily, then increase the tension as we go along. Indeed, even the final rehearsal is still a preparation for the concert, rather than a model of it. In other words, some conductors conduct a concert at every rehearsal, and we others like to build the whole thing up gradually to concert pitch. It was interesting to see how even Toscanini, working with a British orchestra, realised that with the utmost willingness they could not give him his maximum tension before the great day. Nikish, too, from whom I learned so much by attending his rehearsals many years ago, seemed to approach them from the easiest possible point of view. He would start by going straight through a work or a large section of it, and he would then go through it again, perhaps skipping passages that had gone well at the first reading, but dipping into the places that needed hard work and giving them hard work, but never losing sight of the fact that it was a rehearsal and not a performance. His object seemed to be to improve the whole thing gradually within the rehearsal time at his disposal, but not necessarily aiming at one definite ideal performance. He would often touch up a salient passage, and when that was right, leave it to the players to apply what he had done to other passages which might be similar. The longer I live and work, the more strongly I respect the players with whom I am privileged to make music. After a preliminary run-through, one often finds that at the second approach, the things that one might have stopped and talked about have all corrected themselves through the skill and judgment of the players. We conductors all talk too much. We needn't be afraid of trusting the orchestra.
After our conductor, Sir Adrian Bolt, comes our soloist, George Malcolm. He's best known as a harpsichordist, but in fact this Scot is one of our best all-round musicians. He's an operatic and a symphonic conductor, he plays the organ and the piano, and was for 12 years director of music at Westminster Cathedral. But we hear him today at the harpsichord. The minuet I've just played was composed by Henry Purcell, possibly the greatest musical genius that England has ever produced. His fame, as you probably know, rests largely on his magnificent choral and dramatic works. But today I'm concerned with something much slighter and smaller, though no less beautiful, and that is Purcell's music for the harpsichord. Out of the thirty-odd volumes of the Purcell Society's edition of his works, the pieces for harpsichord fill one slim book of less than 60 pages, and although accompanying parts for the harpsichord are to be found in the scores of nearly all Purcell's works, yet as a solo instrument he seems to have thought of it as little more than a beautiful toy to be played with, or played on, as an occasional relaxation and for only a moment or two at a time. This little piece, called Hornpipe, is typical. Not all the harpsichord pieces are quite as short and light-hearted as that. Indeed, some of them contain music which is as profound as anything he ever wrote, like this movement from the G minor suite.
While I have that G minor suite open in front of me, I must play you the quick prelude from it to show you the brilliant technical harpsichord writing of which Purcell was capable, but to which, unfortunately for all us keyboard players, he devoted so little of his time. pieces I have just been playing were published in the year after Purcell's death by his widow. In fact, the only example of his harpsichord music to appear during his own short lifetime was his contribution of 12 lessons, or very short pieces, to an album called Music's Handmaid, issued by Henry Playford in 1689. Characteristic of these tiny and attractive little playtime compositions is this minuet in D minor. Here's another tune from Music's Handmaid, this time a gay one. I hope that from these few short movements I've played to you, you will have been able to judge what a pleasant and light-handed and beautiful style Purcell had when he wrote for the harpsichord. And in conclusion, I just want to play you his version of the famous Lily Barrera, which he called the New Irish Tune, though whether he composed it or merely adopted and adapted it, we shall probably never know. That was George Malcolm playing the music of Henry Purcell. And now we come to our Lotta Lehmann corner. Madame Lehmann was in London recently to direct a series of master classes for young singers given in public at the Wigmore Hall. Seeing her brought back many memories of her greatness as an opera and leader singer. Here she is handing on some of her wisdom to a young American member of her class. And the recording you can hear now was made at an actual lesson. Lincoln Clark sings heimliche Aufforderung by Strauss. 
I sang it with Strauss, and when we, uh, when we rehearsed it, I took a very wrong tempo. Uh, he wants it very slowly. Und wandle hinaus in den Garten zum Rosenstrauch. But I felt it very differently. I felt it very quickly, and I started. Und wandle hinaus in den Garten zum. He said, "Are you crazy? What's the matter with you? <laughs> This is a slower tempo." And I said, I think that's terrible. I feel it quick. And he laughed. He had very much humor. And he said, no, this is very wrong, but uh, let's go through it. So if you like it, I want to hear it. And I sang it very quickly. And he laughed very much on the end. He said, what you do is entirely wrong, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your glass filled with golden wine and drink to me, and I will drink to you. Don't be shocked uh, that all the people around us behave rather loud, because they seem to be all a little tipsy. They are very happy, and let's be happy with them. A few days after this class, Lotta Lehmann came to the studio to tell us about Richard Strauss, so many of whose work she had sung. She began by describing how she eventually sang all three of the female roles in Der Rosenkavalier. Oh, I started 1910, my career. 1911, I sang Sophie. And then later on, I sang Octavian. And 1916, I came to Vienna. That was then the court opera, and I continued to sing Octavian. Well, then I, one day I found on my writing desk the uh, contract for Covent Garden. But if I wouldn't sing the Marshallin, the contract wouldn't go through. They needed a Marshallin. I had never sung it. Mm. I saw Covent Garden, I saw Bruno Walter, and without thinking I signed it. And I learned then very quickly the Marshallin. And when I came to London, I will never forget the first rehearsal with Bruno Walter. He almost fainted when I said to him, I've never sung it. But he helped me tremendously. And that I perhaps fitted into this, this marvelous performance uh, without disturbing it, it was really something. I was never a very exact singer, I must say, to my shame. Really? Yeah. <laughs> But Strauss didn't care. Strauss was really fantastic. He always wanted, for him, the most important thing was the whole role, the, the, the conception of the role, the effect on the audience. And he didn't care if one was very, uh, very exact. Uh, when I sang for the first time Christine in Intermezzo, the premiere was in Dresden. And he had uh, given the premiere only if I would sing Christine. They didn't like that at all, which is very understandable. They wanted to have their own people, but they had to consent. And in the rehearsal, when I made my first mistake, everybody looked at him. And he interrupted and started to smile and said, you know, I know Lehmann is not, uh, Lehmann is a very erratic singer. But I must really say I like her better than all the exact singers in the world. <laughs> so that was rather, and mm. forgive me that I boast about that. Well, one can see that in several Strauss parts. I mean, Clytemnestra, I don't think anybody could actually sing all the notes right. No, you, and you, Intermezzo, you know, was something very new. Mm. It is a domestic affair. It is really a story of his own life. Mm. And uh, there is the Kapellmeister Storch, that is Strauss, really. And Christine is really Pauline, mm. his wife. Mm. 
And since his wife always fought with everybody on earth, so I had to fight through the whole opera. And um, he gave me the greatest compliment he could give to anybody. He said to me, you know, Lotte, you really remind me very much of my wife, which... Uh, Did you take that as a compliment? I, I, after, <laughs> after a moment of breathtaking <laughs> silence, I said, thank you. <laughs> Was Pauline there? At the performance? Oh, yes. And how did she like to see herself represented by you on the stage? She found everything terrible. She, she always found everything terrible. What she her was husband a singer, wasn't she? Been. Oh, he, she always said his music is dreadful. She likes only Masne and Puccini. <laughs> <laughs> Poor she man. said that always. Oh, he loved that. Really? Oh, he loved it. He adored his wife. You know, he was accustomed, everybody bowing down before him. Mm. And I was for two weeks in his house in Garmisch, in his uh, um, country house, studying with him, the dyer's wife in Frau ohne Schatten, the woman without shadow. And after this time was over, he said to me, now Lotte, you have, have lived now through very many fights I had with my wife, but I give you the assurance that one of her fits of fury is to me more interesting than the adoration of the whole world. One can, one can understand that in a way. Yes, in a way, but she was really Except dreadful. that nobody else liked her. I mean, they no. all found her dreadful, didn't they? Oh, no, she was, she was to everybody terrible. Mm -hmm. She was really... Mm -hmm. Do you know the story when they, uh, went, uh, when they got engaged? It's a very well-known story, and he told it to me himself, so it's very authentic. Mm -hmm. Uh, when he was a young conductor, she sang with him, uh, Tannhäuser, and she has made a mistake, and uh, he interrupted the rehearsal, and she took a book or anything which she had in her hand and threw it into the orchestra. She was an absolute devil, I assure you. Mm. He interrupted the rehearsal, very furious, and went to her artist room, and people uh, outside uh, hear terrible shrieking, I find they didn't know who kills whom in this moment. <laughs> And then somebody from the orchestra came, and they had made up their mind they would refuse to play in future when Miss Diana, Pauline, when she would sing. They felt they owed that to the maestro. And they knocked at the door, and he came out, and they told him that. And he said, Ray, with a radiant smile, I would regret that very much, gentlemen, because I got just engaged with Miss Diana. <laughs> Marvellous story. Yes. But what sort of man was... To, I mean, it's curious that he put himself into his music so much. Now, that is all I think. I think it was all to, to uh, create a monument for his wife. I really think so. He, he adored her so that it was uh, quite overwhelming. There never existed anybody like his wife for him. Mm. Uh, how you say how he was as a person, I found him... When I lived with him, rather disappointing. Um, he talked very much about money, about uh, what his operas bring him, and uh, being so under the thumb of his wife, one didn't feel his presence in his home. One felt the presence of his wife very much. Only when we rehearsed, there was Strauss, the real Strauss. And I sang almost every evening, I sang his, uh, his leader with him. And he took leader from early times. And sometimes he said, oh, my God, I have forgotten that entirely. Let's do that. And then Paulina also, I saw then another side of Paulina because very often she came and broke into tears and embraced him. And there was always some reminiscence which, uh, which some they sentimental shared. Association. Some sentimental, yeah. But the, for him, the, the, certainly the mood was what well, the... That was the, the main the feeling, thing. the overall conception of the part. Yeah, and the characterization, you know, really to, really to bring a part to life and to, to, to be the part, that mm. was to him much more important than anything mm. else. And now to end with, here is Lotta Lehmann as she was in her heyday, and Strauss in his. The final trio from Rosenkavalier, as recorded some 30 years ago. Lotta Lehmann sings first as the Marshalin, Elizabeth Schumann is Sophie, Maria Olszewska is Octavian.
final trio from Rosen Cavalier brings to an end this edition of Talking About Music, in which you heard the voices of Sir Adrian Bolt, George Malcolm, and Lotta Lehman. This is John Amis saying goodbye to you all from London.